understand better what Purview can do and, and what we're doing within this, this kind of piece of capability. So um, yeah, feel free to, to shout the questions out or drop them in the chat as they work their way through. And the next slide oh, was the last one for me. Um, so just in terms of a very quick kind of update on, on transparency and really for, for those who are perhaps new to us. So we are a pure play Microsoft Cloud partner. Um, we will turn nine at the end of February. The business has been built around Microsoft Cloud. It will continue to be built around Microsoft Cloud. Um, we are very, very fortunate that because of that, I think we are able to call ourselves specialists in that space. Um, you know, the organization has kind of built from modern work into Azure. That's obviously transitioned into security, into application development, into biz apps, into dynamics. Um, it's, a, it's a huge you know, opportunity for us and a big way we support our customers and we work you know, very, very closely with Microsoft. In terms of accreditations, um, we hold all six partner designations with the other uh, six boxes you can see uh, on screen. Oh, uh, they should move forward for everyone. Uh, I've just seen your, your note, Patrick. Are the slides moving forward for everybody else? You should be able to see a box of logos or the Microsoft logos. I don't know if it's no, loads of thumbs up. It's just you, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> um, you might want to just jump out and, and, and back in, mate. Not sure why it's doing that, but thank you for the thumbs up. Glad everyone else could see it. Oh, it's not working for Salish either. Do you want to just drop the presentation mm, in certainly. and bring it back up? Mm. Wonders of working with live technology. Good job we're not trying to sell teams, right, on this conversation. Perfect. So hopefully everyone can see. So it's the, the transformation partnership clarity slide. So it has the list of the, the logos. Um, so yes, we hold all six partner designations, um, which are the, the core kind of competencies that, that Microsoft put out to partners. They are now based around um, capability and delivery of that capability, different to the previous silver and golds that people will be familiar with, which were much more um, kind of criteria based. So pass an exam, hit a revenue target, and they started to dilute um, the partner ecosystem a little bit in terms of where people had real kind of knowledge and capability so th those were changed I think end of towards the end of 2022 early 2023 um, we, we now hold all six of those um, and we also hold 13 special uh, advanced specializations that's the right name for them which are the black boxes underneath so again diving down into specific technology areas within those core stacks we have to submit customer references again it's based around capability and showcasing um, what we can do but everything we, we do as an organization is built around Microsoft and specifically Microsoft Cloud um, and we support the, the kind of core areas on screen um, by also being part of MISA so Microsoft's Intelligence Security Association which is an invite only uh, group that we got brought into as part of our Microsoft based SOC um, obviously not as relevant for today's conversation but a lovely badge for us to have um, and is also further supported by Azure Expert MSP status so um, top accreditation you can hold as an Azure partner um, within Microsoft is something we picked up about two years ago um, a lot of hard work to keep to get it a lot of hard work to keep it um, but again just shows us as a differentiator against other partners of which there are a lot in, in the UK and you know, there are a lot of people doing some of this but not to the level and the breadth that, that we do so I think without further ado Ian I'll hand over to you for the agenda and run through the content yep. um, actually before we do that sorry I'm going to just dive in quickly before I forget the polls and then remember halfway through um, mm -hmm. I always like to start off the sessions with a quick poll um, it's interesting for us to get a little bit of a feel in the room of where people might be around the specific topic so again assuming teams um, plays ball this should pop up on screen um, obviously just looking from the subject of, of data subject requests that we're going to touch on today and how to leverage purview be good just to understand if any of the tools within the suite are being used by people um, I've added in just for some light humor and um, panic as I suspect there are some people here that if they got one would have absolutely no idea what to do with it whether they've got the tools or not um, but be great just to understand where people might be um, with that in their journey and I now promise that's it for me <laughs> till the end so over to you Ian. Uh, no problem so um, thanks for that guys so to have a little uh, idea of what we're going to talk about today um, I kind of just put together a little bit of an agenda um, so essentially we're going to talk about the technologies um, that you can use in Microsoft Purview for uh, the requests um, I suppose so first of all we talk about what are subjects rights requests uh, or data subjects requests um, we also then think about how traditional tools or how we've used traditional tools to handle them so the kind of processes that organizations 
might go through, uh, might set up um, internally. Um, most probably one of the most important things that we'll then talk about is the creating and refining of searches. So there's quite a lot of very good basic searches uh, available to you when you first uh, start search. Um, but then it's also then about having to navigate the challenges, uh, whether that's finding incorrect data, uh, which we find quite a lot, and the other uh, main challenge is when you find too much data, so the search becomes unwieldy. Um, once we've got an idea of how we've refined those searches, um, then we'll look at more importantly what you can do to how you can action the search results. Um, which I think has always been quite a pinch point for a lot of organisations in terms of how do you provide that information? And if it's uh, something like an erasure, how do we actually go about removing that? And um, so we'll kind of look at uh, some of the tools that are available to you there. Um, and then also, how do we lighten the load of data subjects requests? Um, they are quite labour intensive or time intensive. So really, it's trying to work out with what tools can we cut down either the responding time or the engineering time that it takes to extract the results from that. So I suppose the first point or the first starting question is, well, what do we mean by data subject requests? So there were eight subject requests originally created uh, with GDPR. Um, they've since been kind of enshrined straight within to UK GDPR protection as well. Um, so you can see that list on screen, so the right to be informed, the right of access, the right of rectification, erasure, processing, data portability, right to object, and automated decision making. Um, not all of these would necessarily apply to uh, most of the requests you receive, so really we'll be concentrating on the, the kind of uh, main two today. Um, so they are the um, right of access, um, commonly kind of referred to the subject's access request, which is probably the most commonly uh, requested. Um, and it's probably one that you would have seen um, most during your time. So that's essentially where a user is able to um, request uh, you to provide a export or a list of all the information that you hold on them. That can be made by uh, individuals uh, verbally or in writing, and also third parties can actually make that request on behalf uh, of another person. Um, normal kind of uh, standard rules across them all, uh, you normally have about a month to respond to these. Uh, you can actually extend that uh, by a further two months if that request is complex um, or if you receive a kind of a multiple requests from that individual. So um, obviously we understand that it's a, uh, as, as we just I mentioned earlier, it's quite labour intensive. So if you do have multiple uh, requests from one individual that can really kind of bog you down, so you can uh, extend that slightly. Common usage here would be um, someone's asked for all email communication um, uh, regarding them. So uh, that generally is kind of quite a, a nice, easy search to start with. Um, but we'll go into that when we look at it. Um, the second one that we'll concentrate on is the right to erasure. And uh, the right to erasure is a slightly trickier one um, just because of the uh, tool set that you may have to kind of leverage to complete that. So the um, it's also known as the right to be forgotten. Um, this one slightly isn't actually absolute, um, and there is kind of really certain circumstances where it applies. So it may be kind of um, former employees uh, with a kind of a tribunals or things like that, um, or if you've uh, collected kind of information from marketing and someone essentially wants um, their information then removed. Uh, again, the request can be made uh, verbally or in writing. Generally, you've got a month to respond. Um, but yeah, they're the kind of two main ones that we'll probably focus on today. So 
what Microsoft technologies can we use? These are your main four, um, all in different uh, ages and um, slightly different kind of uh, founding reasons. Um, but content search is uh, the kind of classic, if you like. So um, that is uh, the one that's been around the longest. Um, and certainly if you've ever dealt with Exchange, um, that's uh, certainly been around for um, quite some time. And that provides a basic ability to go and search your locations for specific content. Uh, it doesn't create kind of a case management. Um, and in that respect, it's quite a simplistic tool. However, it is quite an important, um, or it is a very important one, um, because those content searches are really what the other ones, uh, the other technologies uh, build themselves on. Um, and so if you get your time, uh, it's a good place to go in and just practice or um, get comfortable with the, the pure searches on themselves. So without the uh, kind of trappings of a, a full case. So then from there, you probably step up to looking at e-discovery. So the standard uh, one, so e-discovery standard uh, is more your E3 kind of level. That gives you uh, the ability to create a case around the um, subject's rights request. Um, but it kind of gives you fairly basic controls there. So you can create a case, um, you can um, build a content search around that so it keeps it kind of all in one place um but it doesn't really have some of the review features the advanced kind of features um that you'd get if you stepped up to e-discovery premium so that's more your kind of e5 level um you get the advanced analytics here um, and the ability to um review uh, and redact uh, kind of centrally and so you're not having to export um, and kind of manually go through any of those processes. Um, and then finally, the, uh, the newest one of the bunch. Um, so that's previous subjects rights re requests. This is where you start taking the um, case features of eDiscovery, but start layering some of the other kind of purview uh, or more recent features of purview on top, such as um, having the ability to then flag items for deletion directly from the case. Um, and this also provides the subject's rights request provides a much uh, better end to end workflow. Um, I'll go into all of these in a bit of detail um, and I'll kind of provide a little bit of a demo uh, at the end so you can kind of see what they look like a little bit more in the real world. So first things first, how do we go around creating content searches? Um, in simple terms, um, we'll define where we're searching um, in the first bit, so the search locations, um, and then we define the conditions of that search afterwards. Um, so uh, if only it was uh, as simplistic in returning results as that, but in very basic terms, that's what we'll do. So in search locations, for the most part, that will be um, quite often uh, everywhere. Um, so depending on the uh, level of detail in your request, um, it will quite often end up being all, say, all mailbox locations or all, share, all SharePoint sites. Uh, if you're lucky enough to have a kind of a detailed search that's specific, to a core set of uh, individuals or for a core kind of project, uh, et cetera, then you can actually scale that search down in that with those options that I've shown in that first slide on top left. Um, to more specific use cases, uh, which is good because the more you can, um, uh, more detail you can have in that search and the smaller the scope is, the easier it is to process any of the results that come out of the other end. So once we have those locations, then we're looking into the conditions. 
Um, conditions is probably where you will spend uh, most of your time if you're having a complex search or a tricky search. Um, because it's really a, a, a bit of trial and error for the most part. Um, uh, there are obviously defaults and starting points. Um, but if you are having a large amount of results, this is where you'll have to come back in, refine your search, alert search again um, um, for review. Now, when you're defining the conditions, uh, there's two ways you can do this. Um, so on this slide, on the right hand side, um, I've got the uh, kind of GUI based uh, query builder, um, which is uh, where I'd recommend you could start. Um, so that would allow you to um, select some certain uh, conditions, so whether that's dates, the type of message, uh, the participants, recipients in kind of a drop down menu and then fill in the values underneath. So. That would be a good way to kind of see the logic in kind of a, a, a GUI based format. Um, and there is the other way, which is the KQL editor, which is the, the bottom left of that slide. Which is where you can get a little bit more creative in terms of the rule set. So if you notice in my um, search conditions on the right hand side, uh, the first part I've got is date, um, which has a set of dates and then and a message kind. Um, there's not much kind of configuration or customization there to start adding um, is not kind of features. So if you want to exclude items. So. What I recommend you doing if you're not comfortable with KQL um, and it does uh, take a little while um, is build a search condition. In the query builder for your kind of basic structure, and then you can take that across and into the KQL editor. Um, you can just select the kind of uh, and I'll try and show it later in the demo, but the next um, selection under the where it says query builder and that will swap to the KQL editor with the contents that you've built in the query builder. So that should help get you a bit of a head start um, into that. So I won't go through all the conditions. Um, Microsoft have quite good documentation on that, um, but uh, I do want to kind of talk about uh, just some uh, ones that may help you in terms of reducing down the number of results that you get. Uh, and this is probably where even if you have built in the query builder, you'll probably want to switch into KQL. So how do we refine it? So. Um, to whittle down a large number of results, see one thing would be uh, is to change the locations you're searching, but in most cases uh, they're kind of fairly predetermined. Um, so the next thing to do would be to review the data that it finds and start looking for false positives. Um, and to do that, uh, you'll be able to, re depending, e this is across either um, e-discovery or content search, you'll be able to kind of look at the, the results. Uh, e-discovery will be easier to review the sets and uh, in the demo, uh, I'll go into that. But if I give an example here, um, so I'm searching for uh, Victoria, um, and this is uh, something that I can, uh, you don't kind of think about until uh, you hit it, but if I'm searching for messages from Victoria between these dates uh, on email, um, and it's with a certain participant. Now, uh, when you um, start doing that search, you may find quite a number of false positives. And in this instance, uh, Victoria being quite a common name and the name of uh, a queen or two, um, we have quite a few streets uh, that may bear Queen Victoria's name. So um, if it's found Victoria, it may find that. So in order to reduce down the number 
of uh, results I've got, I want to exclude uh, the names of the streets. And this is where uh, spending a bit of time with KQL is um, enlightening. So the logic for excluding them is not to find Victoria and then discount the uh, false positives, but actually to say not. So don't tell me anything about Queen Victoria Street nor Victoria Road. But it's so but find me Victoria. So it's it's the logic kind of uh, is feels slightly backwards um, or it did to me when I first uh, started looking at this. So. Yeah, it's um, it's again one of those things, spend a bit of time with it um, and it will pay dividends. And um, just a note um, again, I'm not going to go through all of the. Uh, uh, functions or um, but uh, case matters. So an and in capitals is different from and in lowercase. So an and in capitals works as an and function. Um, but if you put and in lowercase, that will um, uh, kind of almost be included as a word. And KQL editor is pretty good at being able to highlight these things to you. So if you come in here, you start typing something and it thinks the syntax is wrong, it normally does tell you with uh, quite a nice big uh, set of red lettering. So we've built a case, uh, we've built a search. Um, so, and that would kind of be all we could do in content search. So what could we do with e-discovery? So e-discovery allows us to start treating this search as part of a case, which essentially it is. Um, so e-discovery standard will allow you to build the search that we just talked about and also have that contained within a case and you'd be able to place some of that items on hold. Um, that kind of traditionally may have been used for kind of more litigation-y areas, but obviously for um, if you're looking for uh, to hold all of someone's data, if someone's requested their data and you hold it, you may not necessarily want that to be deleted during your search, so you can put it on hold as well. eDiscovery Premium um, allows much better analysis, case management. You can specify custodians specifically, so you can kind of, uh, if you've got something that is specific to a set of users, you can kind of put everything for theirs on hold whilst the um, request is dealt with. It's got a better end when workflow. Um, and I'll try and step into it in the portal, but it should give you a much easier time of reviewing and tagging items. Um, and it also enables some centralized communication. So um, one unforeseen issue that you can quite often find with a um, data subject request is by communicating about the case, you then essentially generate more work. Um, so but keeping it kind of centralized, and I'll come on to that in Priva, um, helps reduce down kind of any double handing of work. So we've um, we've done such, and then depending on your license level um, and what you've got available to you, you've either had that um, had that search created in eDiscovery Standard or eDiscovery Premium. So. Once you've got to that stage, then you obviously want to process those results. So. What do we do with those results? And this depends on the data subject request. For right of access, e-discovery ports and exports would suffice. So if someone has just said, please give me all the information um, that you have uh, on you know, uh, my email contact with blah, blah, blah. Um, you can find those in eDiscovery, wrap them all up, um, and then you just got to securely provide uh, reports and exports to people. Um, and you can download those directly from the eDiscovery case. Um, so that's kind of fairly well dealt with. Um, and then you, once you once you provide it, they've confirmed they're happy. You can close down that case. Now, the becomes slightly trickier if there is an erasure request because of that. 
um, or the request is a request to start with. So from e-discovery, um, both standard and premium, there's not a kind of a one button um, delete all. So if you were having a erasure request with e-discovery, for email deletions, uh, you essentially use Exchange Online PowerShell. Um, so I put an example of um, how that would work there. So you use the new compliant search action, search name. So that would be the uh, search that you performed within uh, eDiscovery, and then you use the purge um, flag on that. Um, and then you get two options for the purge. So a soft delete means it goes into the recycle bin available, um, depending on how long your recycle bin is available for. Um, and then you get hard delete, which is a permanent deletion straight off the bat. Um, now that although it covers uh, emails, Teams, you'd actually use Graph API. So um, it's kind of the same format. Uh, so you look at the e-discovery case, the e-discovery search, um, and then you'd use the purge data format. Um, the trickiest part comes for SharePoint and OneDrive. Now, that is either if you've got, say, a former employee or um, someone who's created a lot of kind of documents where they're the author that they're requesting removed um, and it's suitable, then your options there really are around a, a manual deletion. Um, if you have retention labels, um, uh, like you have a short retention label available, um, then you can use that. Or um, you can actually use uh, use PowerShell to pull from locations from a CSV file, um, which is uh, probably the, if you're comfortable with uh, the PowerShell scripts, how to call it, and you're creating your CSV, um, can save a lot of time. But obviously I do just say that comes with a, a word of warning around um, sufficient testing um, of that. So all of that's quite, labor intensive in terms of dealing with an erasure request. So how can we lighten the load? Um, so previous subjects rights request is specifically really designed to deal with these. Um, and this is kind of what I'll just jump into in a moment and show you. So we can lighten the load by leveraging this. So it provides even better case central kind of management than eDiscovery Premium. Um, has all the other features, but also better communication in terms of uh, you can have a Teams channel assigned to the case, which will then close when you close the case. Um, and you also have a bit more of a guided setup in terms of what request you're attempting to do. So it will build the search and the appropriate actions for you. And in the case of an erasure request, you have the uh, data deletion. So when you actually review your um, searches and you're happy with those, you can then flag items um, to actually be automatically deleted. Um, and the way this works is um, you flag it um, and it will um, apply a um, data lifecycle um, retention label um, that's normally set for about seven days. Um, so you kind of, once it's all been approved, that label gets applied to the information in SharePoint OneDrive um, and then seven days later gets automatically deleted. So it very much takes away some of the technical kind of uh, labor that's required for an erasure request and starts leveraging um, some of the other Microsoft tools available. So um, it's probably hard to explain just looking at a slide. So what I thought I'd do is um, jump into uh, my portal here. So um, if you've not seen the um, Purview portal before, um, down on the left hand side is where you'll find all your technologies. Um, so for instance, where we talked about eDiscovery standard and premium um, and content search just here. Um, but what we're just going to look at is down at the bottom, it's the subject's rights request. And most tenants here will have a, um, a Priva trial potentially available to you if you do. 
um, then that trial allows you to have 50 cases um, on a, uh, straight off the bat. Um, and so in, here's some uh, searches I've made earlier. Now, these are at different stages, so I can try and show you um, exactly what they look like. But if I show you, first of all, how we'd create a, a tem uh, using the templates. So as I mentioned, the when you look to create a request, you have some kind of guided uh, methodology. So whether it's a access request, an export, uh, a deletion, um, and then you do have a custom as well. So if I just take the um, access request, you can then say, well, who's the requester in terms of related to your organization? So are they a customer, current employee, former employee, prospective, or other? So um, it kind of that will refine some of the search settings that it makes. Um, so if I so if I select customer and you can see these here, it says we tailored the search and conditions. So you can hit view conditions and you can see some of the items that it's looking for. So um, in this case, it's not looking for exchange because I haven't specified that. And is it look and it's not looking for those users to have authored any content um, because obviously they won't have had access. So if I look at a current employee, um, then we can start looking at editing those changes um, and kind of getting a bit more of a, a tailored experience. Um, so you can also apply your residency. Um, this is really just so that it gives a kind of timer on um, the local regulations as to where you are. And you can specify, for instance, in here that it kind of falls under the um, UK Data Protection Act. And then the time frame is how long uh, this search. So most quite often uh, a search will come in with a, a specified time frame of say last 12 months, etc. So that is very much different to um, if you were trying to use a e-discovery premium case um, where you just kind of create a, uh, a case, but there's no guidance in terms of what you're trying to follow. And once the case is created, um, then you have a kind of a, a number of steps. Um, so if I look at this one here, which is in a, a data estimate, this is the very first stage. So this is when it will have, um, based on the information I've given it and what I've told it to go look for, um, if I edit the search, um, so I've said this is a current employee um, that here they're looking for and it's an access and then set my deadline. So this would then show back the data that collected. This one won't find any. Um, uh, and then you can add in internal notes on here, add collaborate, collaborators to work on this case. Um, but you can see at all times there's a, uh, a progress kind of workflow that you need to follow through. So once you've done your search, so here I've got um, one for Adele, and um, this has performed the search and found 89 locations or 89 items in SharePoint. It's also flagged to me if any are labeled as com uh, confidential um, or if any are designated as records, and this will come into play later on. Um, and I can look at the data that's been collected for Adele. Um, here and I can preview uh, the individual items and you see I have this review status here. Um, so if I if this is a deletion, obviously I don't really need to redact anything. Um, but what I can do here is um, either up here um, select include and this will flag this contract document and say right. Um, I, I'm happy that this should be included and therefore deletion when I close this project. So this allows you to go through and kind of, uh, again, this is unfortunately still a, uh, a little bit of a labor intensive um, bit of work, but we can include items for deletion, flag them all through here. And then once we're happy, we can then complete the review. 
which will then move it from uh, the review data here into generate report. So at this point, the deletions will go for approval, um, depending on who you've added in and said um, can approve those. Once they're approved, they will then be flagged for automatic deletion. Um, at that point, they get tagged with a um, essentially a data lifecycle management label, which is previous specific. Um, so I'm not sure if you'll have come across these, but I'll just show you. So you can hear it just gets tagged with a previa delete. So after seven days, based on when it was labeled, that content will then be automatically deleted. Um, one thing to note with these, um, if you are doing a deletion and uh, with previa, if the item has been labeled with a um, retention label, uh, these kind of standard Microsoft um, rules of retention apply. So um, Priva won't be able to overwrite that label. You'd have to, um, using automation or something else, remove that label from the item first um, and then trigger the deletion. Now, if you do set it to delete and um, uh, in the words of Blue Peter, here's one I made earlier. And um, when you set an item to delete, you get in the reports a action log. If the portal wants to load for me. Um, and so it's a CSV, an action execution log, and that's a CSV that you can download and you can see the outcome. So if items have failed to apply the label, you'd be able to see here um, that they failed and the reason for them failing. When you are adding items for deletion in the review, and it, if it thinks it's got a label, it will actually give you a kind of a bit of a notification. So it's worth just having a little check at what might be on them before you complete that review. So once you've completed the review, you can generate reports. You can give the report to the uh, requester, um, and then obviously everything will get flagged for deletion. So that's a very whistle-stop tour of how um, Microsoft Priva uh, can help in terms of lightening the load of what can be quite an arduous task otherwise. Um, so um, if anyone's got any questions on that, I'm more than happy to field those now. Thanks, Ian. Yeah, I appreciate it. I think you could spend hours, right? <laughs> running through some of the detail on how to use it. So um, yeah, yeah, thank you for obviously running through that with everyone. I guess just in terms of um, kind of next up questions, appreciate where we're at time um one of the things we always do as part of these sessions is, is put forward a kind of a level of follow-up and um what we would like to put forward to everyone obviously still on the call um it's an opportunity for a kind of one-to-one -one session with um ian or, or one of the other guys in the team to actually run through this in, in a bit more detail you know, how can you leverage purview not just from a um kind of dsr perspective but from a, a data classification security perspective Obviously, understanding license requirements, standard uh, challenge, right? For for any of the Microsoft products, of what do you have? What do you need? To be able to do some of these, um, and obviously specifically how to you know continue to leverage purview for for DSR. So, um, just by way of again, and the one I created earlier, um, or actually Natalie created for me, um, a, a poll just very very quickly. So, if that's something that's of interest, uh, we can ask one of the team to to follow up with you, talk through it a bit more detail, and then look to arrange a, you know, a bit of a session and run through you know one two hours. Um, with Ian or someone in the team. So if that's of interest, um, please do let us know. Um, and just whilst people are running through that and just a guess follow on from Ian's point, if there are any questions, it's been a quiet day in the chat, uh, which is absolutely fine. But if anyone's got any questions, feel free to drop them into the chat or if you have um, if you want to come off mute and, and shout them out, you're more than welcome. Um, but if you haven't got any questions, just a final thank you for taking the time to listen to me at the start um, and to then run through the detail with Ian. And we look forward to seeing you on another one of these in the future. Cool. So I think we've got a um, couple of questions um, uh, around uh, redacting Perfect. and annotating. Um, so uh, it's probably easy if I just show 
those are my here. questions, if you can hear me. Um, yep. And, do, and does, the, does the annotation then form part of the, re, the access output? Yes. If you, so, if you start writing on it, you, we shouldn't tell this bloke this thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Then that's going to be form part of the request itself, isn't it? The annotation. Uh, exactly. So um, the, the key difference is the difference between notes and annotations. Um, so if I just jump back into my portal, it's probably easiest to show you there. Um, so if I'm looking at a, a request here, I think I've got some data collected. Um, and so, for instance, we have a contract. Um, so this person, this request is obviously to provide them with the information. Uh, we might not necessarily want to provide them everything in the contract. And this very much depends on, again, the tooling that you're using. Um, but certainly within Priva, when it wants to load, um, you can see here I actually just do have a a full redaction, um, because I've selected export, it kind of um, oh, okay, it's automatically said right. You're probably only going to redact that now, um, so then you can come in here, uh, do a error redaction, etc. Like that, um, and then when you include it, um, you can essentially then uh yeah export it with redactions or you could actually if it's an individual item that you just want to provide you can download the redacted version if you're in um e-discovery again it's the kind of yeah i think you uh, must have a look so it's the let me just try and think of one where i've got um any data so um slightly different view this would be so in eDiscovery Premium, you'd have your collections, which is your searches and review sets is where you'd come and look at the items. But yeah, you'd have the annotation and in the annotation, you have a redaction box um, okay. that you'd essentially be able to do uh, that with. Um, but yeah, so it's um, there are and it does normally tell you in there if there's notes, then um, uh, the notes will be internal. But yeah, um, annotations. Uh, or redactions kind of would be um, more external facing. Yeah, so the notes don't form part of the request. Sorry? <laughs> the notes don't form part of the request. Yes. We, yeah. We like it's... it there. <laughs> <coughs> um, yeah, okay. so notes notes are more internally focused. Okay. Is um, Priva an add-on for E5? Uh, so, yeah, so Priva is done on a kind of, it's part of, um, so the subjects rights request is part of Priva, um, but preview you uh, the subjects rights request is a per kind of it's charged like per case. So you, if you do the trial, you get fifty cases, and then you can buy subsequent case, kind of cases in ones, tens, hundreds. Oh, okay. Um, so it's kind of done on a uh, per case usage. Smashing. Um, fifty should last so, long enough until everybody catches on that. <laughs> um. I hope that answers those. Um, uh, I think there's another question about giving data manager access to purview rules or guidelines um, within um, roles and scopes. Um, there is a permission, a specific purview solutions bit. Um, you can create a custom scope um, for that, um, depending on how much they want to kind of uh, give. So, um, yes, subjects rights request makes it easier for a DPO to kind of take control of that. So, yeah, very much. Uh, create a, a role scope for them. So, what happens if it finds documents which you're not allowed to see in your role, or is the is the is the purview guy able to see everything? So, um, there is kind of within roles and scope. There's two sets you can do. So, you can have kind of con uh, like a, a list viewer and explorer. Um, but yeah, essentially, the the idea is with this, anyone who's performing that search has to be able to see. Everything. kind of uh, everything now there are um, as mentioned in the deletion um page here the priority items to review so if you did have items labeled highly confidential you'd have an idea from here so yeah. you, you may be able to be a bit more selective as to who's got what um cool one data content classification using on-premise uh, so there's another question just about using the information protection scanner and refining content classification. So um, that's really going to be more around identifying PII using the data classifiers. Um, so you'd 
auto, that's automatic classification. Um, so you could do a search based on any items found with a sensitive info type of passport number, you know, um, et cetera. But yeah, that would be based off the sensitive info type classifiers here. So that answers that one. Any more for any more? I mean, I think it's really interesting. I mean, you do need to sort out your labels and your classifications at first, don't you? Yeah, I mean, they all, uh, my, uh, I say my specialist being pair of you, uh, I will never stop singing the praises of spending time uh, with sensitive info types and getting your labels in yeah, yeah. order. I bet you're fun at parties. I am Ian. thrilling, <laughs> absolutely <laughs> thrilling. Um, but yeah, um, if you get all that in order, then all your searches become easier. Obviously, in the yeah, real yeah. world, it can take a little bit longer, but. Cool. Thanks a lot, guys. Really useful. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Um, I don't know if there's any final questions. Obviously, thank you for the few that came through at the end there. If not, um, yeah, feel free to drop off. Thank you for joining us this morning. We look forward to speaking to you all soon. Thanks, everyone.